Okay, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker of today, Surav Chatterjee, who is now at the IAS, and he's going to talk about spin glass phase at zero temperature in the Edwards Anderson model. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Margarita, and thank you, Hal, for organizing. Uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to talk in front of this audience. Um, so, um, uh, so, you know, uh, this is a talk targeted, you know, we have prepared targeted towards graduate students, you know, in earlier seminars, but so um, maybe, you know, various slides will be too low, low level for most of you, but, you know, bear with me. Um, so, um, so spin glasses are magnetic materials with some strange glassy properties and they're, they're actual materials, certain kinds of alloys uh, are, um, are exhibit spin glass behavior at low temperature. And uh, one of the characteristic properties of spin glasses, unlike ferromagnets, is the position of many different states with near minimal energies, which is sometimes called this multiple value picture. Uh, and mathematical models of spin glasses have proved to be very difficult to analyze. Um, and perhaps it's because the materials themselves are complex. So, you know, you cannot have a model that is simple to analyze for something that exhibits very complex behavior. Uh, so the, the spin glass models, um, as of now, they fall broadly into two categories, mean field models, such as the schenker kirkpatrick model, where all particles interact with each other, or the more realistic lattice models, uh, the Edwards-Anderson model, where the particles only interact at short range. So uh, there has been a huge progress in the last 20, 25 years on the analysis of mean field models. Uh, so for example, some highlights are Telegram's uh, proof uh, of the Parisi formula or Panchenko's proof of ultrametricity in certain classes of mean field uh, spin glass models. The Edwards Anderson model, on the other hand, uh, as well as uh, other models of spin glasses and lattice, remain largely uh, intractable. And even the physicists are not unanimous about the true nature of lattice spin glasses. Okay, there is, uh, there is uh, no consensus about various aspects of lattice spin glasses. Um, in particular, there is uh, there is no proof or not even a consensus whether the Edwards Anderson model has all the features uh, desired of a spin glass uh, in some regime of temperature or dimension. Okay. So let me um, quickly introduce the model. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, the Edwards Anderson model is defined as follows. So you take some dimension and some length uh, L and you take the um, cube V, zero, one up to L to the power D. And let E be the set of nearest neighbor edges of V, the usual set of edges. And to each edge, you have a random variable. So that's the coupling. So in the case of the Isaac model, you have the coupling is just one. Uh, here you have random variables. Uh, in this talk, there'll be standard Gaussian random variables. So to each edge, you have a Gaussian random variable. And the Hamiltonian is defined as follows. So the set of configurations is minus one, one to the V. So these are spins at each lattice site uh, in this cube. And the uh, energy of a configuration is this, minus the sum over all uh, IJ, which are neighbors, GIJ, sigma I, sigma J. Okay. So it's just like the Ising model, except that the spins, uh, neighboring spins uh, can either have um, uh, positive or uh, negative uh, interactions, okay, ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic interactions, okay? So that's the, that's the Hamiltonian of this model, the edwards Anderson model. And a ground state is a state sigma depending on this disorder which minimizes this Hamiltonian. So we are now talking about a finite cube. So, uh, so we can talk about minimizing the energy. And uh, these are Gaussian random variables. Uh, so it's not hard to see that they're with probability one, there are exactly two ground states, sigma and minus sigma. And this pair is called the unique ground state pair for this finite volume model. Okay. And we can also consider some given boundary condition, typically that's taken to be independent of the disorder that fixes the spins on the boundary. Uh, or we can consider a periodic boundary, boundary condition which identifies the opposite faces of the, uh, of the cube. So there are uh, these uh, different uh, kinds of boundary conditions. Okay, so that's the, that's the Edwards and this model and it's the simplest spin glass version of, um, uh, of the Ising model that you can think about. 
So what are some of the available results about the ground state um, of this model? So one of the earliest results is by Eisenman and Weyer, who proved that the fluctuations of the ground state energy are of order L to the D by two. So it's uh, the square root of the volume. The volume of the cube is L to the D, and uh, they proved both upper and lower bounds showing that the fluctuations are of order L to the D by two. Now, one of the standard things that one does in mathematical physics is to consider infinite volume ground state. So you can you take L equals infinity. And the notion of minimizing the energy no longer makes sense in infinite volume because you have an infinite sum in the Hamiltonian. However, if you consider the difference between the energies of two states that differ only at a finite number of sites, that is well-defined and finite. So you, can, you cannot talk about the energy of a state, but you can talk about the difference between the energies of two states if the two states differ only at a finite number of sites. That is clearly well-defined. And an infinite volume state is called a ground state if overturning any finite number of spins results in an increase in energy. Okay, so, so you have you have your GIJs now all over uh, for all edges in the lattice. And you have a state and you say that the state is a ground state uh, if it has a following property that if you flip the signs of finitely many, any finitely many spins, uh, it, will, it can only increase the energy. Okay. So that's, that's called an infinite volume ground state. And given any value of the couplings uh, by a simple you know, compactness argument, you can show that ground states always exist. Uh, however, it's not clear that, um, you know, now you have the GIGs are all, all random. So you have to choose a ground state and, uh, you know, can there be a measurable selection? You know, there are these technical measure theoretic questions that come up. Uh, can you choose a ground state from the given uh, GIGs in a measure, as a measurable function of the GIGs? So what Eisenman and Ware uh, did uh, is, um, Sorry. Uh, so what Eisenman and Ware did is that they um, they constructed a different object, which is the following. Uh, so given the environment, there is a well-defined set of ground states. You can construct a measurable map that takes the environment, all the GIGs, to a probability measure on the set of ground states. So so you know you have the set of all probability measures on. Um, on the set of all states, and there is a subset of probability measures which are supported on the ground states. And so the set of all probability measures on all states, that has a topology, that has a well-defined sigma algebra. So what you can do is you can take a measurable map which inputs the environment on the one hand with the product sigma algebra and produces a, a probability measure which is supported on a set of ground states. And this map, which goes from the set of environments to the set of probability measures on, on um, uh, configurations, that is a measurable map. So such a map is called a meta state in this literature. So, so it's it's sort of a you know random ground state that you are producing. Okay. So the mathematical literature has focused mainly on the study of meta states. Uh, in particular, Chuck here in the audience is one of the uh, leaders in this uh, in this effort. So. Um, so one of the main goals has been sh uh, showing uh, two dimensions. There is exactly one ground state pair in infinite volume, probability one. Uh, well, sorry, this line is not correct. So actually uh, I learned that the phases, in 2D at least the phases also think that this is, this is true. Uh, so in, 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 in 2D, uh, one wants to show that there is exactly one ground state pair uh, in the infinite volume with probability one. And then uh, the, Biggest progress on this is using a result of Newman and Stein from 2001, arguing Damron, Newman and Stein in 2010, they proved that a certain meta state in the 2D half plane, not the full plane, but if you consider it on the half plane, uh, is supported on a unique ground state pair with probability one. So, uh, so there is a certain um, natural meta state, uh, so which is a random ground state, is supported in a unique ground state pair. Uh, so, so this is what I know, and there, there are other results which I'm not mentioning here. You can see in my preprint, uh, and uh, but this is the most significant thing that has been proved in this direction, and uh, and that represents kind of how little we know about the Edwards-Anderson model, and in particular, there is no proof that this model exhibits any kind of spin glass behavior that is different than a ferromagnet. So, so the goal in in two dimensions is to mainly show that it's sort of like a ferromagnet in some sense. Uh, in two dimensions, it does. It's not supposed to show spin glass type behavior. Mm, uh, 
but in higher dimensions uh, maybe. So, uh, so that's that's the that's what we roughly speaking what we know. Okay, so what do I mean by spin glass behavior? Uh, so I'll talk about something you know very basic um, with what one can try to prove. So consider the icing ferromagnet on the cube uh, where the G edges are all one for all um, edges. And the ground state pair is just sigma minus sigma where sigma is all ones or all minus ones. Okay. Now take any region in this cube which is, whose size is of order into the D which is occupying a positive fraction of the, um, of the total uh, area, total volume. And suppose you overturn all the spins in this region um, and you take the ground state and you just flip all the spins. So you take the state of all ones and you make it all minus one in the region A. So what's the increase in energy? The increase in energy is um, exactly the size of the boundary. So this edge boundary, the number of edges going from A to the complement of A. Okay, that's, that's how much the energy increases. The physicists tell us that in spin glasses, it is possible to overturn a macroscopic region of spins with an energy cost that is negligible compared to the size of the boundary. And that is, and they have some very precise conjectures about, uh, uh, you know, how how much that would be. So, so there'll be exceptional regions, uh, which, you know, uh, there'll be regions which you can overturn all the spins, but um, the, the cost of the energy cost is not uh, like the size of the boundaries, much smaller than that. And this is sort of one version of the multiple value picture. So for example, uh, there are you know, competing claims uh, through numerical studies um, in 3D that the energy cost can be as small as L to the one fifth. Uh, and that's an old prediction or uh, a more recent one is uh, order one. And, um, um, and note that these are much smaller than the typical size of, uh, uh, of the boundary. And the boundary, if we have a macroscopic region, the boundary is at least of order L squared in three dimensions. And the main difficulty is that in um, three and higher dimensions, finding a suitable you know, ground state is an NP-hard problem. And uh, it's actually computationally uh, very hard. And uh, I have seen simulations up to L equals 32, but uh, not more than that. Maybe maybe one can do. But in two dimensions, you can do more extensive simulations, uh, you know, larger, much larger simulations. But in three and higher dimensions, you cannot really simulate and uh, get the result. Okay. So that's one marker. And um, so, so what is the heuristic? So the physics heuristic for the existence of uh, low energy excitations is cancellation. So, so you have GIGs are plus or minus one. And so of course you expect some cancellation from the boundary. And so you, you, get, um, um, you get a much smaller increase in energy. But this is not, uh, not quite right. So what I proved a few years ago and I didn't publish, but it's in the, it's in the recent preprint. Uh, I proved this theorem that there are positive constants C1, C2, and C3 depending only on the dimension, such that for any A in this region, uh, this ratio, which is the, the numerator is the energy cost of overturning all the spins in A, and the denominator is the size of the boundary, the probability that this ratio for any given region, the probability that this ratio is less than this constant C1 is exponentially small in the size of the boundary. So for a given region, Actually, if you overturn all the spins, if you take a region and you overturn all the spins in the ground state, you can still expect to see an energy increase that is of the same order as the size of the boundary. So the cancellations are not sufficient to guarantee that this, this is very small. Okay. So, so one can expect from this that, you know, maybe, so this since is exponentially small, maybe you can sum over all regions and just show that there isn't any region like that. So the cancellation, you know, the, the conjecture is not true, maybe. So, so that's, that's what I was trying to prove. So, so just to summarize, for a given region A, overturning the spins in A incurs an energy cost um, uh, of the uh, order of same order as the size of the boundary with probably extremely close to one, just like in ferromagnets. So even if this multiple value picture holds, it holds only for exceptional regions of overturned spins. And given the theorem in the previous slide, one can imagine that such exceptional regions do not actually exist, at least in certain dimensions to certain graphs. So, uh, so you know, I was trying to prove maybe in high enough dimension or, uh, you know, maybe some different graph, maybe the hexagonal lattice or some other lattice in 2D, uh, you can actually, uh, this constant, the exponent can be large enough so that uh, even if you sum over all regions, you don't get uh, something small. 
So, so that's what I was trying to do for a while. But then I realized that very generally, uh, such regions don't exist. So, so you cannot really find any reasonable graph, at least short range models, so bounded degree graphs. Uh, so there will always be exceptional regions where these this cancellations take place and uh, you the energy cost of overturning is very small compared to the boundary, okay? So that's what I'm going to prove now. And that's the first uh, uh, theorem. So here's the theorem, take any dimension and any L, uh, let V be this cube and let F be the minimum of this ratio. So the energy cost of overturning all the spins in the ground state in the region A over the size of the boundary where you take only macroscopic regions in the sense that I'm taking regions whose size is between one quarter and three quarters of the total volume. And then I can show this inequality that this minimum uh, being bigger than some constant times root log L over root L is uh, less than or equal to the one over the square of the constant. So, so this becomes small if you make the constant large. Uh, so, so with high probability, uh, you know, this F is of order square root log L over L, okay, at most, at most square root log L over L. So, so there will exist, they, they do exist with high probability, uh, these exceptional regions. And the theorem that I have in the paper doesn't, isn't specifically for this um, um, graph, it's for a much more general, you know, you take a boundary degree graph and then you have some, uh, some version of the theorem. So, uh, so this is just for uh, simplicity of exposition, I'm showing this. And uh, so that's the, that's the first theorem, okay. So let me pause here for a moment if there are any questions. Okay. So although there, there isn't, uh, for a given region, this is not true, there will exist uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, exceptional regions where this is true for, for a spinning glass. So this, uh, so this is, this distinguishes it from the icing type in a ferromagnetic model. So this is, uh, you know, some kind of spin glass behavior the first time that it has been proved in the Edwards Anderson model. Uh, the, does this, uh, does this ex extend to uh, all other distributions than Gaussian for the couplings? So I haven't proved that, but um, I, I believe that's true. Uh, I am not sure about, so it's, it's, I'm not sure about discrete distributions, but if you have a continuous distribution, uh, so what I'm really using, I, I'll go into that later on, what I'm really using is the Hermit polynomial basis for, uh, for Gaussians. Um, and if you have a continuous distribution with a nice you know, polynomial uh, L2 uh, basis, then uh, probably the same argument can be carried through, but uh, you know, that needs careful checking, so I'm not completely sure. Okay, so, uh, so let me move on. Um, so the next result, and these are all, all uh, tied together, so they're, they're connected. Uh, so another physics conjecture about the ground state of this model is that it's sensitive to small changes in disorder, some uh, phenomenon is sometimes called disorder chaos. And let us consider two kinds of perturbations, both determined by a parameter P between zero and one. So one kind of perturbation, the first kind, is the one that's more common in the physics literature where, where we replace this Gaussian variable by a slightly perturbed version of itself. So you take one minus P times JE plus square root two P minus P squared times JE prime, where J prime is another set of ID standard Gaussian variables independent of J. And the coefficients are chosen to ensure that this linear combination is also standard Gaussian. And the second kind of perturbation, uh, what we do is each coupling is replaced by an independent coupling uh, with a probability P independently of each other. So with a small probability, I just replace J by JE. And in both cases, the perturbation is small if P is small. So we'll say the perturbation is small if the parameter P is small. So in the second case, if only a small fraction of couplings are replaced by independent copies, and the first case, each coupling is replaced by a small perturbed version of itself. Okay, so this, this first kind of perturbation is more common in, uh, in um, physics, and the second kind is more common in the probability literature. So I'm considering both kinds of perturbations. Let sigma be the ground state in the original environment and sigma prime be the ground state in the perturbed environment. The site overlap between two configurations is defined simply as this. So you take the inner product of sigma and sigma prime divide by the total volume. So there's a number between minus one and one. If sigma and sigma prime are exactly the same, the, this overlap is, uh, is one. And if sigma 
is sigma prime is almost orthogonal to sigma. This is close to zero. The side overlap is said to be chaotic with respect to perturbations of the disorder if this RP is close to zero with high probability for some P that is close to zero. Okay. So, so if you if for some very small P, so again, close to zero meaning depending on the size of the uh, cube. So if uh, as L goes to infinity, uh, if P is, if you can show that for some P very small, this becomes close to zero with high probability, you say that uh, there is disorder chaos. And this was conjectured first by Fisher and Hughes and then Bray and Moore and verified in various numerical studies. So there isn't much controversy about this. So this is supposed to be true. And so I have a theorem about that. So, um, so for V in zero one up to L to the D with any given disorder independent boundary condition, we have that for both kinds of perturbations, uh, the expected square of the overlap is bounded by one over LP if D dimension is one, one over L squared P squared dimension is two and higher. And if you have free or periodic boundary, then you can improve it to one over L to the D, P to the D. Okay, so this means that if P is much bigger than one over L, uh, then this overlap is close to zero with high probability. So if P is much bigger than one over L, um, this uh, right-hand side is small, and uh, this, is, this is close to zero. Any questions about this? Okay, so um, okay, so let me now go into the proof. Um, so in the physics literature, how the arguments go is usually the multiple value picture is taken as a given, and then the chaos is argued as a consequence of these multiple values. And I will go in the opposite direction by first proving the chaos theorem and then deducing this multiple value picture as a consequence of, uh, of the chaos. Okay, so let's start with a very simple case, which is just one dimension. So consider the Edwards Anderson model on zero one to the L with boundary condition sigma zero is one. So you just impose that the spin at side zero is one. And in this case, you can explicitly write down the ground state. So you can, you can prove very easily that sigma i is the product of the signs of these gijs, j01, j12 up to gi minus one i. Uh, because you know, if you put this to be your sigma i, then the, um, then the energy becomes minus summation absolute gi, and that's the minimum it can possibly be, obviously. Okay. So, so suppose now, uh, so this is the ground state. Suppose now we replace, you know, perturb the coupling. So you perturb each gij, by a small factor, so gij plus j0 times kij, where kij is independent standard Gaussian, g0 is a very small constant, and these are the notations that are typically used in, in physics papers. So this shows that if i is large, suppose i is large, um, and i is much larger than one over j0, okay? So typically, you know, gij doesn't change sign if you do the small perturbations. Only a small fraction of the gij's are going to change sign. So what is the fraction? It's like one over j0. So if gij is between you know minus one over j zero to one over j zero, then then you have a chance of the design will change. So approximately one over j zero fraction of the uh, sorry j zero fraction of the um, uh, sorry it's not one over j zero. So it's j zero. So if uh, so if j zero fraction of the of the gij's will change sign. Um, but so if i is much larger than one over j zero then the sign of sigma i becomes unpredictable because after this perturbation, a large number of these signs will change, okay? So if i is very large, uh, although a small fraction of the gij's change signs, there will still be a large number of uh, uh, these, these signs that will change and they will change unpredictably. So, so this total product will be, you know, uh, plus or minus with roughly equal probability, even after a small perturbation, okay? So this, this formula makes it clear why you can have chaos uh, in uh, the ground state in one dimension. This is the argument made precise uh, in Bray and Moore with expressed estimates. So they, they studied this in one dimension and they conjectured that such a thing will be true in higher dimensions also. The problem obviously in higher dimensions is that you don't have a formula like this. Okay, so, so for the ground state in one dimension, you can write, write down the ground state, but in higher dimensions, you cannot write it down. So this argument has no simple generalization to higher dimensions since there is no explicit formula for the ground state in dimensions two and higher. 
And this is one reason why these questions have remained unsolved because you know there is no formula for the ground state. You don't know what the ground state is. Uh, and the second reason uh, why this is this model is difficult is because none of the standard tools that one uses, such as correlation inequalities or monotonicity arguments, they apply to the Edwards Anderson model. So those those things do not work. So now we'll, I will now show how the one-dimensional argument actually generalizes in principle. So there is a way you can generalize the one-dimensional argument. Okay. So here is the here is the method. Take any i and j, fix some i and j. And consider sigma i times sigma j, where sigma is a ground state as a function of all the couplings. So you take the, this, this is in finite volume. So there is a unique ground state up to overall sign change. So this product is a well-defined function of the couplings, okay? So it's a, it's a function that takes value plus or minus one, but it's a complicated function. Given all the couplings, you get a specific value. Unlike in one dimension, we do not expect this to be a function solely of the signs of the couplings. Uh, everything will be involved now. So the sizes of the couplings will also be involved, just not the signs. Now, whatever this function is, uh, it can be expanded in a multivariate Hermit polynomial series since the multivariate Hermit polynomials form an orthonormal basis of L2 functions of independent Gaussian and variables. So I'll tell you more about this if you're not familiar. Uh, so, so the you know, any L2 function of a bunch of Gaussian random variables can be expanded in an infinite series uh, of polynomials, so linear combinations of polynomials. So I will now show the main idea is that all terms this, in this expansion have degree greater than or equal to the distance between i and j. So this is, this is a polynomial. In one dimension, you saw that it's uh, sigma is a product of many signs, and that's why it was very unstable, because the product of many things and so even if a few of these things uh, kind of change sign, sigma will change sign. So what I will show here is the same thing happens in higher dimensions also, that this is now not a product of signs, but it's a polynomial. Uh, it's an it's a infinite uh, sum of uh, linear combination polynomials. But all these polynomials have a very high degree if i and g are far apart. And that's why this chaotic behavior happens. Okay, so that's the, that's the main idea. Okay, so what's the Hermit polynomial expansion? Let uh, H0, H1, H2 be the orthonormal basis of normalized Hermit polynomials for L2 mu, where mu is a standard Gaussian distribution, H0 is one. Okay, so if you have a standard Gaussian distribution, there's a um, orthonormal basis of L2 of mu. So H0 is one, H1 is X, uh, H2 is you know X squared minus one over root two and so on. So there's a Hermit polynomial basis. And then if you have a whole bunch of Gaussians, there's a higher dimensional version of this. So what you do is the orthonormal basis of L2 of J, where J is the set of all couplings, is formed by products like the following. So it's indexed now, so that in one dimension, it's indexed by non-negative integers, zero, one, two, three, et cetera. Now you have a non-negative integer for each edge. So the indexing is N is a bunch of non-negative integers, one for each edge. And given such an N, the nth Hermit polynomial, multivariate Hermit polynomial is a product of H, N, E of J, E, okay? So for example, if there are just two edges, uh, you know, edge one and edge two, then it will be indexed by N1, N2, and the, you know, the, you know, H, N1, N2 of J1, J2 would be H, N1, J1 times H, N2, J2, okay? So these products form an orthonormal basis of L2 of J. Right, so it's indexed by these um, tuples of non-negative integers, one to each, one for each edge. So any square integrable function of the disorder can be expanded in this basis, the usual you know expansion uh, in Hilbert spaces. So f of j can be written as f hat of n times h n of j, where n is this multi-index. H n of j is a multivariate Hermit polynomial corresponding to the index n and f hat n is the Fourier coefficient. And f hat n can be easily obtained as the inner product of f, G, f and h n, which is expectation of f j times h n of j. And the same series on the right side should be interpreted as the L2 limit of partial sums where the order of summation is irrelevant. Okay, so this is a very important slide if you want to follow, through, follow the proof. So please ask if, uh, if something is not clear.
So any, any function of the couplings can be expressed like this as a linear combination of these, uh, uh, of these multivariate polynomials where each uh, where the, these are indexed by tuples of non-negative integers, one attached to each edge. And given such a tuple, uh, the multivariate Hermit polynomial is a product of univariate Hermit polynomials applied to the individual JEs. And the coefficient can be obtained as the expectation of FJ times HN of J. Okay. So as of now, we don't know what these coefficients are. So we, we have this one function, which is a product of two ground state uh, spins at two sites. Um, and that's a function of all the couplings. And that's a very complicated function. We don't know what's the, what's the polynomial, but we know that there is a polynomial expansion. Okay. So here is the main lemma. So take any distinct i and j, that sigma be the ground state, consider sigma i sigma j, uh, as a function of as a function phi j of the disorder j, so i and j are fixed. Now, we consider this a function of the disorder. Now, for any multi-index n, you define a graph. Let e n be the set of edges uh, in the cube where n e is strictly positive. So some of the n e's are zero, some of them are non-zero. Uh, you take those edges for which n e is strictly positive. So, so given any multi-index, it defines a graph on V and let V n be the set of vertices that are endpoints of these edges and let G n be the subgraph, uh, which, is, which consists of these vertices and these, these edges. Okay. So you take any multi-index, it defines a graph, a subgraph of the original lattice and you take that subgraph. Uh, and this, this lemma is a main ingredient. Um, this phi hat of N, so this is a phi, you're considering its Fourier coefficient, the nth Fourier coefficient of phi. This is zero unless both i and j are in Vn and the connected components of Gn that contain i and j are either the same or they both intersect the boundary in case we have boundary condition. So if you don't, if you want to keep things simple, don't you know, consider boundary condition, let's say you have periodic boundary or uh, you know, free boundary. In that case, this, uh, this phi hat of n is zero unless both i and j are in the same connected component of this graph. Okay. So you're looking at the Fourier expansion, the Hermit polynomial expansion of this sigma i sigma j considered as a function of the couplings. And this Hermit polynomial expansion is indexed by these um, uh, tuples of um, uh, integers attached to edges. So these are multi-indices. And for each multi-index um, defines a graph where you keep only those edges for which n e is strictly positive. And then I'm saying that phi hat of uh, phi hat of n is zero unless both i and g are in the same uh, connected component. Okay. Okay. So let's prove this. Consider the case of free boundary for simplicity, uh, and let us work on the assumption that i and g are in this v n. Uh, you know, otherwise there is not much to prove. Um, so so let's show that i and g are in the same connected component of this graph. So suppose not. Okay, suppose they are not in the same connected component of the graph. Then there's a contour gamma separating the components containing i and j such that no edge in gamma is in en. So, so there you will be able to find a set of edges which separate i and j. So no edge uh, in this contour uh, will be um, a part of en. And so there is no path from i to j if and only if this happens. Okay, and this is true in any dimension. So suppose we replace j by minus j for each edge in this contour and let j prime denote the resulting disorder. Note that j and j prime have the same law. You're just taking some fixed contour. You're replacing all the j's by minus j in that contour. So the resulting uh, environment has the same law. It's just again, I de Gaussian. On the other hand, replacing j by j prime changes sigma i sigma j to minus sigma i sigma j. So, so the effect on the function phi that we have the product of the ground state spins at i and j, if we flip all the j's in this contour, um, the, the ground state is flipped inside uh, the region, uh, you know, one of the two regions separated by the contour, uh, the ground state is flipped and so sigma i sigma j becomes minus sigma i sigma j. But on the other hand, the Hermit polynomial hn of j is the same as hn of j prime because hn of j doesn't depend on the, on the variables in this contour because this contour is completely outside this en. 
So combining this, what you get is pi hat of n. We know it's equal to expectation of sigma i sigma j times hn of j. Now, this expectation remains unchanged if we replace j by j prime. But on the other hand, uh, it becomes expectation of minus sigma i sigma j times hn of j if we replace j by j prime. So, so this gives this equality, which shows that phi hat of n is zero. Okay, so this, this you know, uh, you know, I don't know uh, how to do it better without a blackboard, but uh, uh, this is um, this is what I what I have. Um, and so I'll again pause here for a minute. Okay, so let, let me just repeat the argument here since I have time. Um, so, so you have this i and g, which are fixed vertices. You consider sigma i, sigma g as a function of the disorder, which is which I denote by phi. So sigma is a ground state. So phi j is a function of the disorder uh, and it takes value plus one or minus one. Now I'm looking at the nth Fourier coefficient of phi, which is phi hat of n, which is the expectation of phi j times h n of j. And I want to show that this nth Fourier coefficient is zero if i and g are not in the same connected component, uh, meaning that if you can find, uh, if you cannot find a sequence of edges connecting i to g so that n e is strictly positive uh, for every e on that on that um, on that uh, path. So if there is no such path, then there is a contour separating i and j such that each edge in that contour n e is zero. So it's, uh, you know, it's uh, no edge in that contour is, um, is, in this, uh, is in this graph Gn. And therefore what happens is that if you flip all the Js in that contour and J prime with the resulting disorder, then J and J prime have the same law. So expectation of phi J times Hn of J is the same as expectation of phi J prime times Hn of J prime, but phi J prime is minus phi of J and hn of j prime is equal to hn of j. So, so you get this, this identity and therefore phi hat of n is zero. Okay. Okay, so, so once you have that, um, so let's, what's the main consequence? So suppose so we have fixed i and j and consider sigma i sigma j as a function of the disorder. For a multi-index n, let phi hat n denote the coefficient of hn of j is in the Hermit polynomial expansion of phi j. And let uh, E n denote the set of all edges where n e is positive. So this, this defines the subgraph of the original graph. The lemma shows that phi hat of n is zero unless both i and j uh, are in the same connected component. And there is another case for boundary conditions, but let's forget about that. So phi hat of n, n of j is zero unless they're both in the same connected component. This shows that the size of um, the number of edges uh, we, where n e is non-zero at least has to be the distance between i and j. Okay, so if i and j are connected by a path where n e is strictly positive, one immediate consequence you can draw from that is that the number of edges where n e is positive has to be, um, you know, at least the distance between i and j. Right, so you have at least those many n e is positive. So, so thus the Hermit polynomial expansion of sigma i sigma j consists only of terms that are product of at least these many univariate Hermit polynomials. So there's a high degree expansion, okay? And now you can do uh, the usual thing. So let me go through the steps slowly. It's not complicated after this. So, so let JP be obtained from J by applying a perturbation um, of either kind, then by calculation. So the Hermit polynomials are actually uh, you know, um, uh, eigenfunctions of the uh, Ornstein-Lundbeck semigroup. So using that, you can prove this, uh, that expectation of Hn of Je, the perturbed version of Je given Je is just some one minus P to the N of Hn of Je for, uh, so now you're, this is univariate Hermit polynomials. 
And using that, you can um, you can prove that the expectation of H and of JP. Now, now for the multivariate case, you, you prove this, that uh, the conditional expectation becomes one minus P to the sum of N E's uh, for the perturbations of the first kind to the size of number of edges. So anyway, so this becomes, uh, you, can, you can do this calculation, sigma I, sigma J, what's the expected value of the perturbed version of sigma I, sigma J given the original environment. You can do an exact calculation of this kind. And the main observation is that um, these, these are all large because unless these are large, the phi hat n of z, uh, phi hat n is zero. So from this, uh, you know, you carry out these calculations and then you show that um, this conditional expectation has a, you know, uh, has a small, uh, has a small, is, is small if uh, P is much bigger than, sorry, N, N times P is large, where M is the distance between I and J. Okay, so you can you can carry out some some calculations like this, uh, and then uh, you know um, uh, you know you can end up with this result that if you take sigma i sigma j times the perturbed version of sigma i sigma j, the expectation of this product is bounded by uh, one minus p times the minimum of the, well forget about the minimum one minus p time to the power of the distance between i and j. So if the distance between i and j is much bigger than one over p then this expectation is close to zero. And this gives a mathematical proof of this observation of Brayen mode that the relative orientations of spins with large separations are sensitive to small changes in the, in the bond strengths. Okay, so if, if two spins are have a large separation, then a small uh, perturbation of the bonds uh, is, um, can flip the relative orientations of the spins. And then, uh, you know, you can um, observe that the overlap squared is this. And from that, you can um, you can prove that this this is a small expectation. Okay, so that's the proof of chaos. Sorry, <laughs> it's a little bit technical, but I skipped over the the calculations. But the main idea is that is this okay, that that it has it is a uh, it is a high degree polynomial um, of the variables if um, uh, if i and g are far apart. Okay, that's the main idea. And and since it's a high degree polynomial, it's very sensitive. If you do a small perturbation, it's going to change its value. Okay. Uh, so this is related to Chuck's question. So what is the most essential property of these Hermit polynomials that you used in this argument? Uh, not much. So, so mm -hmm. you know, th this, this slide, uh, so you, you know, this this proof doesn't use much at all. Mm -hmm. I used it a little bit later on uh, when I was, Doing these calculations, uh -huh. but you know, analogous calculations can possibly be done for other. Uh, so what you really need is just um, given a distribution, you need mm. uh, a stochastic process uh, uh, whose uh, you know uh, I, the, uh, a Markov process uh, such as the uh, generator of the Markov process, the the eigenfunctions of the generator form an orthonormal basis of uh, uh, mm. of the distribution. To, mm. to the distribution. So that's all you need. And then okay. the rest of the yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how do you get from chaos to multiple valleys? So how do I obtain these exceptional regions? The idea is very simple. What you do is you take the environment, do a little perturbation, a macroscopic region of the spins will overturn, okay, if you consider the ground state, and you just take that region. Okay, so that will be the exceptional region in the original configuration, which will have the property that overturning will have small contribution from boundary. So, so you cannot exactly identify these regions because these are functions of the, of the disorder, these exceptional regions, which you can overturn with small contribution from the boundary. Uh, but um, uh, but they, you can obtain them by artificially, you know, introducing a perturbation and looking at what region is overturning. So, so let's see. So let A be the region with, that is overturned when you apply a perturbation of the first kind of size P, where P is much bigger than one over L. By the chaos theorem, we know that the overlap between the old and the new ground states is close to zero. So this implies that approximately half the spins are overturned. Okay. So we'll show that the cost of overturning the spins uh, in this region in the original configuration is negligible compared to the size of the boundary. Okay. And the idea is very simple because um, 
because you're applying a small perturbation. So, so the contribution from the boundary isn't going to change by much. But in the new environment, you know that the contribution from the boundary is negative because you know overturning gives the ground state. So if a small change can make it negative, then it couldn't have been big to start with. Okay. So, so, so let me repeat the argument again. So, so you have the original configuration. You have this region A, which is a random region produced by this perturbation. You know that overturning everything in A produces a ground state for the new environment. Okay. So, so therefore the contribution from the boundary in the new environment is negative because uh, if you, uh, you know, um, if you overturn back to the original state, you are going to get a higher energy in the new configuration. So the co contribution to the boundary in the new environment is going to be negative. And the contribution from the boundary in the old environment is going to be positive. But the boundary contribution doesn't change much because of small perturbation. So therefore, if one is negative and the other is positive and the, di and the difference is small, then they both have to be close to zero. Okay, you have two, if you have two numbers, one is negative, one is positive, and the difference is small, then they're both close to zero. So this is the uh, you know, formal argument that yeah, sigma but, but, B- so Sorry, so, but you're giving perturbation all, all, all around the lattice, right? Yeah, all around the lattice, but I just, you know, mm. each edge is perturbed only a little bit. So, so, the, mm. so the contribution from the bound, the difference that happens on the boundary contribution is a little low of the size okay. of the boundary. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so here is a here is a full argument. So let sigma p be the minimizer of the new Hamiltonian. So, so therefore, in the new Hamiltonian, if you input sigma, it's bigger than if you input sigma p. But the difference between these two things can be alternatively expressed like this, uh, in terms of, you know, the difference uh, that you get in the old Hamiltonian with the same inputs, plus something small. And then if you combine these two things, you get uh, this inequality that the difference uh, uh, between uh, the in the old Hamiltonian, the difference between the new and the old ground states, uh, this difference is non-negative, you know that. It's bounded by square root of P times the size of the boundary times the maximum of the J's. And so this the maximum of the J's is a order root log L. So, so therefore you can show that if uh, P is L to the minus alpha for some suitable alpha less than one, then you get a small contribution. But anyway, this is just a calculation. The main idea is that, that the contribution from the boundary changes by little of the size of the boundary if it's a smaller perturbation. And in the old environment, it's positive. In the new environment, it's uh, negative. And so therefore, both are close to zero. Okay. So there are some other results. Um, uh, well, this is not recent. So this is earlier this year. Um, uh, I could prove that um, uh, that uh, in the decay of correlations, the ground state is polynom uh, is uh, you know po polynomial. It's worse than uh, you know uh, that's uh, you know at least well not 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 better than polynomial decay of correlations in the ground state. And this contra contrasts with the exponential of correlations in the two D random field icing model. So the random field icing model is another candidate for spin glass uh, behavior. Uh, so it, there the correlations in the ground state decay exponentially, but here it can be at most polynomial. Uh, then there's a result about the fractal nature of the boundary um, and some remarks about the proof technique. So the idea of analyzing the behavior of Boolean function using some kind of Fourier expansional has appeared early in the probability literature. This is not the first example. So there is the work of Garban, Petty and Schramm on dynamical percolation. Also, I have a proof of disorder chaos in the Schenchen Kirkpatrick model many years ago. So there, there I used this, but but uh, I did not realize until recently that this can be used for the Edward Anderson model. I thought I used to think that only some kind of mean field behavior can uh, can um, uh, where this can a kind of approach can work. Um, so uh, well, there are a bunch of open questions, but. <laughs> You know, I don't know if it is for this audience. I prepared these questions when I was giving a talk for the for the graduate students, but but anyway, I'll 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 still mention the questions. Um, so in three D, does there 
uh, exist a macroscopic region of spins, uh, region where the spins in the ground can be overturned with an energy cost of order one as L goes to infinity. So, so Parisi and his group, they think that this is true, but you know, one cannot be sure with the size of the simulations. Uh, and if false, this would support, well, some kind of support for the droplet theory, but uh, you know, so whether it's order one or not. Um, so uh, we have seen that the expectation of sigma i sigma j in the perturbed version, given j drops sharply to zero uh, as p increases from zero to small positive value if i and j are far apart. Uh, but suppose i and j are neighbors, then one can show that this conditional expectation will not drop to zero, but does it drop sharply to a value less than one? So if you try to put it more rigorously, uh, is it true that if you take this uh, conditional expectation squared and take its expectation in the limit as L goes to infinity, first you fix P and then you send it into L to infinity, you get something less than one, but does it remain strictly less than one as P tends to zero? Okay, so whether there's a sharp drop, so it's like you overlap, if you do a small perturbation and you take the bond overlap instead of the site overlap, uh, does so the bond overlap will not drop to zero, but whether it drops to a value less than one. Okay. So, uh, so this is also what uh, you know, Paris seems to think is true, but I'm not sure. Uh, this is probably not in uh, true in 2D, but you know, may hold in higher dimensions. Um, well, of course, there's a question of a unique ground state. Uh, this is widely believed to be true, but the proof remains out of reach. Um, show that uh, there are multiple ground state pairs with probability one in dimensions three or higher, at least sufficiently large D, and there is, again, not a consensus. Um, there are many open questions about the Edwards and Anderson model at non-zero temperature. The most, uh, well, I, I considered only ground states, but there are a lot of open questions at non-zero temperature. The most basic one is whether there is any kind of phase transition and we don't know any result. Uh, so what would such a phase transition look like? It will not be in the magnetization since the magnetization is always close to zero. Uh, what very see, uh, you know, I've seen some papers in which it predicts that uh, there'll be a phase transition in the site overlap, which will be close to zero at high probability when beta is small, but will have a non-trivial limiting distribution when beta is large. Uh, and moreover, Paris also predicts that the quenched expectation will have a non-trivial limiting distribution when beta is large in this non-self-averaging property. So it's uh, not clear if this is true. And Chuck and Dan Stein, they, they have a paper where they can show that um, uh, in infinite volume, you cannot have a measurable uh, you know, Gibbs state where translation invariant Gibbs state where, where this can hold. So that's not at all clear. Uh, there is also the question of getting a better understanding of the coefficients in the Hermit polynomial expansion. So, so you know, I only proved something very basic about the Hermit polynomial expansion, but uh, in particular, um, if you let uh, ML of R be the total mass, the sum of squares of the coefficients of terms that are of degree, um, uh, you know, at least one edge weight a distance bigger than R from I in J, uh, when considering the system in the G dimensional torus, and you look at this limit. Uh, whether this is positive, okay? So, so, so I'm looking at uh, you know i and g are far apart, but suppose i and g are neighbors, okay? Then I can't say a lot about um, the Hermit polynomial expansion. In particular, whether there is escaping mass, okay? So this is connected to the other questions that I mentioned. So if you take the Hermit polynomial expansion of sigma i sigma j when i and g are neighbors, there'll be a whole bunch of coefficients, okay? contributions from all the all the variables. So of course the nearby variables will have a significant contribution when i and g are neighbors. So of course, for example, if g i g is very large compared to its uh, uh, neighboring values, then that will force sigma i sigma j to have the same sign. Okay, So there'll be a significant contribution from the nearby g, j's, but whether there is mass escaping to infinity or not, whether there's a contribution from far away or not, you know, that's, that's an open question, uh, you know, that I don't know. And, um, yeah, so I have these uh, these results, and uh, yeah, and, and more questions about uh, about uh, the Hermit polynomial expansion. There is, uh, you know, this uh, question about exponents, uh, which I'll not go into. And um, uh, yeah, so and also understand the region of spins that are overturned as a result of smaller perturbation. So right now I can prove something very basic about those things, but what is the exact structure of these regions? You know, understand. 
uh, one, you know, do, do they have one or more large connected components or many small components? And what is the fractal dimensions of the boundaries of these components? So none of that I know. So, so it's, you know, lots and lots of open questions. So anyway, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, now you're free to ask as many questions you want. Uh, I have a, I have a, a, a sort of uh, unfair question. Um, uh, uh, the, the question of uh, you, I, you mentioned among your, the open questions uh, about the you know, number of ground state, number of infinite volume ground state pairs in uh, two in two dimensions and in higher dimensions. What what's your what's your estimate of how many years or decades it might take till one gets a rigorous result of, of either of those sorts? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an open question itself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now there are thirty-five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. You know, I've been thinking about it, and you know, this this question about uh, the. The behavior of nearby spins that can, yeah. The the, the simulations, at least, um, uh, I recently talked to uh, David Hughes, who told me the, the simulations are very clear that, uh, uh, you know, in 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 two D at least, uh, it seems like the droplet picture is true. So, so. Uh, so if we if we assume that the result is definitely true then uh, then maybe somebody will be able to prove it but you know I, I don't know uh, if the result is un unclear then you know people can waste a lot of time trying to prove um, you know the opposite <laughs> you know, which is not true but uh, if the result is true then there is more hope yeah, maybe I have a stupid a question I mean, I'm, I'm of, of, of someone who doesn't really know much about these uh, so here it's crucial that um, the J, the 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 the, the J are actually IAD. So yeah, can it be that they have a little bit that they are not they are almost IAD, but they have a little bit of dependence? Does it yeah. even make the question is just I, not interesting? Or? I think mean, that's that's a good question, and you know one can try to fix the kind of dependence that will that will lead to some. Uh, you know something more tractable that even that may even be possible that you know to inject some kind of dependence that uh, uh, that can lead to a more tractable model. So to, so Chuck and Dan have uh, this other model which is a highly disordered model where the disorder depends on this volume, and and then you can have uh, various interesting results coming out of that. So so you can have all kinds of tweaks to this IID uh, assumption. And also, it's not clear, you know, if you uh, go from continuous to discrete distribution. So, for example, you can take GI just to be plus or minus one in the probability, and that can lead to additional complications, uh, you know, because uh, then there will be many ground states. But not whether that's in a non-trivial way or not, that's a, that's a question. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's not, it's not clear. Maybe Chuck has more to say about that. And Chuck has been thinking about it much more than me, so. Uh, well, I, I, I could point out that even in the highly disordered model, the only complete result, rigorous result about the number of ground states is in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's equivalent to a very interesting question about um, um, uh, the, the the number of trees in the minimal spanning forest uh, which is an interesting question in it, you know from a purely mathematical point of view but it's still no no complete result other than in two dimensions mm -hmm. so some somehow these these things take an inordinately long amount of time to get resolved <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, can I ask one question? So, well, is, is it? Of course, we are interested in finite temperature, but that must be very, very different. But going into the other direction, is it 
possible to do something like this in, in the zero temperature with a uh, uniform non-zero magnetic field. And then uh, I'm not an expert, but I hear that, you know, mean field picture predicts spin glass phase with disorder and uniform magnetic field, but I, I think you don't, uh, from the dropout, dropout picture, you don't expect phase, spin glass phase. So, well, it, have you thought about adding I, uniform magnetic field to this? So what, what do you mean by uniform magnetic field? I'm not familiar with the terminology. What, what, what is that? Oh, you, you add just minus H sigma J. Oh, just for a fixed H. Yeah, just fixed H. So, mm -hmm. and so it favors like plus spin, of course, but still you have this J, frustrated J. So there is a competition. Yeah. Mm. So I, I'm curious what, well, probably some of your techniques survive mm -hmm. with that added uniform magnetic field, but. Mm. Yeah, well, the, the main lemma that I showed probably wouldn't survive in its uh, mm. uh, in the form that I stated because if you oh yeah yeah of course it, of course you, you yeah, cannot you yeah you cannot turn this yeah of course you do not have the symmetry mm. so sure. mm. you have to think you know what what to yeah. do about that yeah of course I mean, the, I mean the, it's an essentially different problem and mm. we, we have to have different strategy but you have some well very useful tools so. Mm. If, if, you, mm. if your question, in some sense, if there is some sort of like an Omega Thalus line in any finite dimension? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of question, yeah. Mm. And anyway, if you can say anything about that from this kind of analysis, that would be great. <laughs> Are there any other questions or uh, comments, complaints? Oh, no, I can, I can <laughs> ask one more. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> one more so what is the role played by dimension in this kind of analysis? So I'm sure I know that things become very easy in one dimension, but Except for that, is everything the same in higher dimensions? Or? This, this analysis is more or less dimension free. Mm -hmm. So the chaos and the multiple valley things that I mm -hmm. showed that mm -hmm. dimension free. However, uh, mm -hmm. this result, which I didn't talk about, uh, uh, this decay of correlations, uh, this has dimension two and higher. So polynomial decay of correlations. In one dimension, you still have exponential decay of correlations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the polynomial decay of correlations that I proved is in dimensions uh, two and higher, and it uses the dimensionality for the mm -hmm. polynomial decay. Mm -hmm. And does it get easier with dimension, or it doesn't really matter what? I mean, uh, once you are in know, dimension larger than two, it's. When it's larger than two, uh, it's, uh, well, uh, the theorem that I have, it, it shows a dimension, it shows that dimension uh, that correlation can decay. Um, at most like one over the distance. It can be worse than that, but it can be it can be at most one over the distance in dimensions uh, two and higher. Okay. And then the constants will depend on the dimension. Yeah, the constants depend on dimension, but uh, the right answer, I don't know what's the right answer. So, um, more questions? I don't hear. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. So I will try to clap <laughs> and we can stop the recording.